um, we want to give you some add-ons, uh, performance monitoring of your environment reports. We also try to contain these reports, but you can also uh, integrate with this and you can generate reports of your own. Um, and as I said earlier, in the second part of the session, I'll show you some other use cases where you can use that. So, so now we we expose three types of uh, three ways for you to to use the API. One of them is use using the REST API itself. Um, the other one is using an SDK, and the third one is just to use a shell. Now the the SDK is based on the REST API, and the shell is based on the SDK, the Python SDK as we as we saw as reference. So basically, you have three ways you can use the API. Now the question is what method you should use, and, and that it that depends highly on who you are, what you want to do, what's your role in the organization you work with. For example, if you're a sysadmin that has a, a, a small environment and you would like to, to do some troubleshooting and you don't want to open the UI and QA, the sysadmin loves, uh, they just love to rely. I, I was a sysadmin and I know I just, oh, now open the browser or stuff like that, or I just want to, to have a look and do a, a few things. So you can just use the shell in order to, to run some operations, to run some, uh, to, to, to view some stuff. If you're a data center admin, managing a larger environment and perhaps you, you can get lost in the QA app and, and uh, you would probably want to, to make some predefined scripts uh, um, that would just fit you best. So you perhaps you would use the SDK in order to do that. Um, and if you're a software developer running in a specific environment where you don't have really an SDK, uh, then you can just use the REST API natively to to HTTP HTTP clients that are available in the environment. So it highly depends on, on, on who you are, what's your level of expertise, and what you're trying to do. The concept of the API, and, and, and when I say API, here I mean all, all the types of APIs, is that they are all integrate with the every service. Um, they are all based on REST as a core, SDA on top of it, and the shell on top of that, as I said earlier. Another thing that, that's very important for us is backward and forward compatibility. So we will be able to use the current API with uh, uh, the, the current SDK, the current uh, shell uh, with uh, um, older versions of the Azure Tangent and also use older, old, older SDK with newer versions. So we, we try, we sometimes get that, but we usually try to keep it as compatible as possible to leave all the options available. And if you deprecate it, then of course you can go to the next GP and they just let it go. To give secure access to the API, you need to supply the credentials in order to use the API. And another thing we added, I think about a year ago, is a session-based app. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So the API is the REST API. Are you familiar with REST? Okay, so if not, it, 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 it's basically built uh, for building blocks, in our opinion, uh, uh, for different HTTP methods, which you use. One of them is get, in order to get a report. One of them is post, in order to create a new report in a collection. One of them is push, in order to modify the report, and delete, in order to delete the report. Just a, as simple as that. Usually, it supports two different media types, XML and JSON. We support that as well. And when you're looking at the structure of, of, of a generic REST client, specifically in our environment, you have the, the protocol you're using, whether it's HTTP or HTTPS, the server and the port, or basically the endpoint you're using, the API, which is the entry point for all the REST APIs. And then afterwards you have a collection, and, and in this example it's the VMs collection, then a resource inside this collection, a sub-collection, VM has bits, so the bits of that sub-collection is the VM uh, inside a specific VM, and there you can access a specific disk, and it can go on according to the collection or sub-collection that you have. So that's the structure of the URI, it's usually like that in REST, as I said. You have a collection, a resource, a sub-collection, 
You get the resource, so here like you're looking at maybe some natural maps. So you have the metadata of the resource, the details in the resource, and here you could learn for the name of the VM, the status of the VM, the memory of the VM, when it was started, etc. And the actions that are available on this resource, on this VM, and links to other resources. For example, the VM VM, for example, has this, so you can access the specific disks of, the, of this VM, so it will link to another resource. Or the mix of the VM, uh, the cluster of the VM is part of the mix of this. So that's the way it's divided. I would say that the actions in here are not related in any way to the status of the VM. I saw that specifically Delta Cloud and other projects as well show you the actions you can actually do on the resource in its cor current status. So it's not that helpful here, and here we show you all the actions that can be done on the resource uh, at specific times. Like perhaps, you know, you, you try to stop a VM that's not running, but then what you know about that. So in order to look uh, at the VM, you, you just do a get on the VM selection. If you want to get a specific one, you, you also use that ttp get with a specific um, ID, create a new VM using call giving the VM details, updating it, and here, and here we rename the VM, so we just pass the new name of the VM, and in order to delete it, we just do HTTP delete and give the resource ID, the, the resource itself, the URL itself. Are there any questions? I mean, it's, it's, it's basic stuff, but perhaps you do need to do it, or I can just read some more. So basically, I'll give you a hint to the base ID of the VM. So what you mean is, so you have a collection of dates, so you could maybe say date and date. It, that depends on what do you want to name and what kind of values you want to give the name. I mean, if, if you we give you the way to add new host, which will install VDF M on them, and to delete them and to modify different properties of them, and that's perhaps, but that's we don't expose in the Orbit Engine every configuration that can be done on the host. So you need to figure out the main way we try to put everything in the engine, every configuration that's relevant for you as a user, but perhaps you would really want to hack that for one reason or another. So it's, it's yeah, but, but when we will access API slash host, you will see the host, the orbit engine is available. And you will be able to do this as well. So I'll show you in a second how you can easily know what you can do with a specific resource. So there are different, I won't get deeply into that, but there are different clients you can use in order to, to, to run this HTTP command. There's different cl REST clients that, that are available in the different browsers. There are command lines in Trinity like curl, for example. You, this is just an example using curl uh, to get a specific VM. So uh, in here you pass the, u the username and the password. You say you want to get an, uh, an XML you say the HTTP method is get, and you give the URL of the, of the specific VM you want to use. If you want to create a VM, then you need to do HTTP calls, and the, the three parameters needed, and this is the minimum of the parameters needed, um, that you need to supply in here is the name of the VM, the cluster that the VM will reside on, and the template the VM is created on. So you would just also use curl with a minus V option and give the body of the VM you want to use. Very standard use for, for of REST APIs. In here to update the VM, you just rename it and you just give the minus P option to curl, giving it the facilities, the, the, the properties you would like to change in the VM. And in order to delete, you issue the delete, the delete command or minus the delete command. Now it's a bit 
hard to understand what you can and can't do in a such a brutal physics brutal environment it's 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 a common problem for us in general because you don't really know what's at stake you don't really know what is mandatory to pass when you create a new resource you don't really know what you can modify in the resource so for that reason we created something we call ISDL which is a restful services distribution layer um, I didn't see if you would be interested in other projects since this is already this is very good idea to do that and I'll, I'll show you in a second some examples for that so um, so basically it, it describes the parameter constraints that we have using the rest API and basically it helps you understand how can you create a resource what what actions are available on a specific collection uh, what parameters do you need to test which one is mandatory which one is optional which one you can't really change but read only um, and the best way is just to show you an example so in here you see I, I access the overt API do you see well you see the view okay and a question mark RSDL so let's assume I would like to know what I can do with the VM collection so let's just look for slash API slash VM okay So I see that if I would if I want to add a new VM to the collection, I need to use the HTTP uh, method, that's the, the post HTTP method. In the headers, I need to supply the content type. Um, it's it's a required field. There are two additional fields here, fields here that are um, optional. And when I get to the body, I know that I need to pass a VM object and a different parameter. So I see that the VM name is required, the template that the VM is created from is also required, either the ID or the name of the template, the cluster is required, and I have a lot of other options here that, uh, that, uh, that are uh, optional. Okay, I see the type of the parameter I want to use, I need to use, um, that's basically it so I can I can just look at that and understand what I can do I can parse that with I if I want to create some clients of mine that, that can do different operations if I want to create a, a, a fancy UI so I, I, I just show the different options to the user uh, and basically it's a very powerful thing because it describes you the API and each time you do a change in the API it also updates the VM so you, it, so every overt engine you use, you can you, you know exactly what you can and can't do with it, and can update it. It's a very pow powerful thing. Now, if we look, we saw here the add operation. If we go down to a lot of actions we create in the VM, so let's go to. So I see that if I need to get to get the VM, all I need to do is use the HTTP method get. I see here the he the header uh, parameters that are in, in here. N nothing is mandatory. I just have um, a parameter here which is optional. Um, I can do different search queries in order um, to get more specific details. Delete. I see that in order to delete. I need to use HTTP delete, delete on this resource. And I guess I will have this much. So if I would like to update a VM, I need to use the uh, entity, the specific VM entity in the URI. And I also have here a list of all the options I can pass. When updating, nothing is really mandatory. You can update everything. You can do no updates. But depends on you so 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 I think it's a very powerful thing depending on when I want 
if you would like to attempt to do that right now. It's the other tree. Yeah, so I've uploaded the slides, by the way. I changed them a bit. If you access the, the website, I guess you can download them and have them available. will put slides here and there, but only you can get them. And this is some functionality we have in your API. That's what I was about talking to Eva ago. And one of them is the user level API. At first, we only have admin API. In order to access the API, you needed to have admin permissions of the Vue.js engine. I won't go over what admin permission means and how it's created in the Vue.js engine, but basically, you needed to be an administrator. And now we also support user level API. Uh, it's just uh, in order to do that, we just added a new HTTP parameter that says that it would like to work with a filtered view uh, because users uh, are only able to see specific objects and not all of them. Administrators, by, by definition in our environment, can, can view anything. They, they tend to do anything, but they can view anything. And also session support. Um, there is some overhead in the REST calls because each time we we need to authenticate the user um, we need to check the, the LDAP credentials to verify that so so rather than we use switches in order to create a session basically um, that you log in at the beginning and then you can do different operations and then log out at the end there are more details about that in the wiki page questions now so far okay so let's move to the shell so basically the, the concept that 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 we 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 did the shell is um, to make it interactive to make it as easy as possible to use and everything can be changed using arrow keys in order to everything you, you're familiar with with any android shell to pipe commands in it and stuff like that we also have help Smart help, basically you can get help from some specific commands, one is a command on a sub collection, a command on a, on a collection, uh, you can just see help and see all the commands you can do. Um, let's go to the specific page and demo of that. So that, that's the overt shell, we perform overt shell, and it's, and you see it's a bit cut on the left, I apologize for that, because it's easy to see that it's too flat. And you can see I see that I'm disconnected, then I'm, I'm issuing the connect command, and I'm, if I double tab, I see the different options, I need to supply the username, the password, URL and that's basically it and then now I'm connected to the overt shell now I can do this so you can see the different hosts in each shell I see the ID and the name sorry again that it's a bit cut I see the ID of and the name and of each of, of each host entity and then I can choose to do show host and the host URL. Then I see different details uh, on this specific page. Um, I can use, my environment is not very uh, large at, at the moment, so I, I won't be using rather uh, different uh, operations in here. Uh, what I can show you is, is a um, help uh, action, for example. Okay, so I, I see the different that when I need to do some actions, I choose that I need to supply the type of the object I want to operate on, the name of the object, and the action I would like to do. Um, let's, for example, have action vm vm vm. Yeah. Okay. So 
more specific here, like the migrant, like the measure, like the stoppage, suspended, deported, travel down, etc. Here there are all the different operations that they do. Again, it's not related to the status of the occupying state that is the VN, but uh, it tells you all the operations that you could have done with it in, in different lifetimes. I can do, I can try to do as change real world as that. This will probably fail because it's it is not uh, alive at the moment. But uh, that's the way I can do different operations. I can delete the VM. I can um, show the VM details. Here is my workshop. We have the different details. So you, you can basically do through the shell uh, anything you could do with the API and you could do with the SDK. It's all the same thing with whole list and the same functionality. If you found out that something that you can do in the API you can do with the shell, that's not a bug, so you should do that. And by the way, if I remember correctly, the shell uses a, a SMSP Some people are against using the word session with the word REST because it could it it has some confusion. Do you guys think that this is a session tree? Um, so when you ask for a resource, you ask for the resource and you get to count this snapshot somewhere. It's not safe that this is anywhere. The session in here is only in order to be more precise. Okay, I have some more examples in the slides. You can ask for a specific, uh, uh, if you list a specific resource, list VM for example, for a specific collection, you can choose to show all the properties. Um, you can filter them out using uh, either a query at the client side, that means that we have to, 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 to fill I guess all the information and, and, and it does the filtering on the client, or to send a query to the object engine to filter some, uh, some to filter some objects out, depending on what exactly you would like to do. You can add, update, or remove a resource. Again, if I would like to, to install a new host, for example, as you ask, so I would need action host Atlantis install and give the root password, which is the only time that I need to do cross check. Then I will use the, the two lines here to show me what parameters are available for that operation. If I'll use the help, I also see if there were details about this parameter. Um, so it's very convenient. Um, and here we added a new VM based on the blank template and it's written in a different structure. We updated the old type of the VM, we added a new NIC to the VM, so we said add new. The VM identifier is this, the name of the NIC is this, and the network I want to create the NIC to is the Here we see an example to create a new disk. Again, checking all the parameters and then uh, attaching the disk to the VM. Originally, disks were not a main collection, so we had we, we are always had disks inside VMs. Um, now disks are also um, a collection of its own, so you can create a disk and attach it later on. We decided to do the attachment also using the create command. Although it doesn't really create a resource, it just connects and retrieves it to a subcollection of the disk. Here we saw, we see how to create the template, create template, what's the VM name we want to create the template from, and what's the name of the template. And when the template is created, we can create a VM. Uh, again, I, I there are endless examples. I uh, just wanted to give you some basis on what you can do with that. Are there any questions?
could decide the API in that way. You have something to add on that, Anna? Leave the tutorial section of the first session. Um, um, I, I promise that the second sec uh, the second section of of the session is, is more interesting with that. Uh, we have a lot of technical details here, but I it's the building blocks for later on. So the SDK is mainly used for integration or automation, advanced automation in that case. We have this oriented. We currently have two bindings for that, the Java and the Python one. Uh, as I said earlier, the CLI is based on the Python one. The Python one is the first binding we have. There are a few uh, other projects that created a different binding for different wrappers for the REST API. One of them is the Optic wrapper with Behavit, and the other one is uh, our Behavit, which created a Ruby binding. I know, few are, I know that our Behavit is not a complete uh, uh, binding for the API. Uh, I'm not sure about Ruby Behavit. You can, I have the link from here. You can go out and have a look if you're interested in coding your own environment. Um, the examples I show here is, is for the Python SDK. The Java SDK is a little simpler and similar and it's exists in Java. There are some examples also on the website. Um, Again, the concept of uh, how it uh, how how we have a complete protocol abstraction, just like the CLI, just like the API. Full compliance with the Ovid API. Um, auto completion is more a feature you know if you are a developing environment, but it's still you know uh, you can use that. It's very intuitive to use. It's auto generated. So once we have a new change to the API, if we do it properly, it will propagate from the engine to the API, to the SDK, to the Python SDK, the Java SDK, the CLI, everything via auto. Um, I can't say that for RB over it and Ruby over it, they are very different packages. For the Java and for the Python SDK, it's auto com completely auto-generated. So in Python, we when we want to, to start working with the engine, we create a proxy, so we pass the, uh, we create a new API object here uh, passing the, uh, the URL, the username and the password, but, and that's, that's good enough if uh, we have uh, an object in hand uh, which we can use. For example, listing the, the, all the collection API that can see, for example, I have a VM collection. I can do api.vm dot something, I can add a VM, get a VM, list all the VMs. Uh, and etc. Very convenient to use. There are two additional options, but these are exactly the ones I described earlier. One of them is to have uh, a simple session, a user level API. If you want, for example, to create your own user portal, uh, you can use uh, the SDK uh, with the filter option, so you, you, you will only show the user uh, objects it can uh, it can use, and you can use the quick change authentication in order to use the REST proxies. I can do API VM drift and pass a query saying I would like to 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 see only this VM. Um, I can give another constraint about the, the memory. I want I want to get only VMs that have this memory. Again, one of them is using passing the query to the engine, and the other one is doing the query on the client side, again, depending what you would like to do uh, in both options. We can ask to get a specific VM. 
and then you can start to say you want to even be on that site you want to say that please send me send me the assignment and you click over here and you can do it like that and you have can access different properties on the VM, for example, the name of the VM, access the cache collection. For example, I would like to add a new mix to the VM, so I access the mix cache collection, press add, pass in the, the, the required parameters, and click OK like that. Here is an example for creating a new VM. So in order to create a VM, I need to say what structure I want the VM to be in, from what template to create that, and that's what you do. So I, I can I can pass more parameters, and these are the normal parameters. So first of all, I get the cluster, the specific cluster I want. Then I get the template I want. Then I create. In, in this example, we created a new uh, uh, Parang VM object using all these parameters and adding the memory I would like the VM to have. And then I'm accessing the VM cache collection doing an add action, passing the parameter that I have created, and that is where the new VM is actually created. If I would like to create a new disk, I say what storage domain I want to, to create a VM on, or uh, the disk on, and, and in here you could say API disk add to create a new disk entity, and the parameters are this is the name, this is the size, Pages, interface, format, and that's all. Once you create a new disk, you can attach it to the VM. You get the vm.disk.add because we add a new uh, this disk to the VM and pass in the disk ID and saying we would like to activate it now. We support hot plugging of this VM as well. Here is an example with mix, getting mix specific interface type and you, you can find more examples on the website but <laughs> basically to give you a knowledge you can do anything with this anything you could do in the API anything you could do in the VM any questions so far okay I'll, I'll describe right of why the, the this could look like Basically, I show you three types of APIs you can use. Uh, the Delta Cloud project adds other APIs as well. Are you familiar with that project? No. So basically, it's an open source Apache project that comes to abstract the, the differences between different cloud providers. It, it basically exposes uh, uh, six, three types of APIs uh, on top of all on top of all the cloud provider it supports. It, so it gives you a way to work with different cloud providers using a unified API. Um, they support three types of APIs currently. One of them is Delta Cloud API, which is their main API, and EC2 API, which is the Amazon Cloud API, and the Simi API, which is the Cloud Interface, uh, Cloud Infrastructure Management Interface. Uh, API. Um, the later two are, are a bit uh, uh, they're not fully complete but a lot of us can find them. So basically if you have an environment uh, with a lot of different cloud providers or virtualization providers you use uh, and you would like to work with a, a common set of APIs on top of that then uh, then you can use Delta Cloud. It supports OVH as well um, again, just a way to use another set of APIs. Um, so these are the APIs that are exposed, and inside the Delta Cloud Server, we have different drivers that merge across the different cloud providers. I won't go into any further details. Um, if, if it interests you, if you already work with a specific environment that has supports the EC2 API and would like to work with OVH as well, you can check it out and see if it fits you. Again, the, the protocol support is not complete yet. Um, I can also say that uh, it looks like the project um, is 
not advancing my uh, what I would have ex expected to to to, to achieve. I mean that sooner is something I have to have. Um, I also have a specific blog post on that. If you if you want to go ahead and read it, it has some examples of using Delta Cloud in Delta Two. So we're going to move to the second part of the session. Um, any questions so far? Okay. So in the second part, we're going to talk about UI plugins. Um, also, a demo of a plugin. I'll show some examples on the slides. Um, then we're going to talk about scheduling uh, plugins for scheduling APIs. And then I'll give you a fun hook. <laughs> They give you different ways in order to customize and then to expand the functionality of the engine uh, and change it to suit your needs. Um, and again, you will probably use, you can use the, the, uh, the SDK. It would usually be suggested to use the SDK to, to do the UI plugins and scheduling APIs, uh, but you're free to do whatever you want. So uh, I'll show some examples of So first, UI plugins. So if you're familiar with Ruler UI, then great. Um, if not, it basically consists of uh, two main parts. One of them is a preview of the different objects in my system. In the other one in here is a tab view of uh, every main entity that uh, intersects with uh, a main tab, data center cluster, storage cluster, we allow to expand currently is this section. If you want to add a new main tab to your system, if you want to add a new sub tab to the system and for a specific, in the context of a specific uh, main entity, for example, in here is the host, you could do that. You could add new action buttons. You could add new uh, context menu items. Basically, in here, you, 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 you can see everything is possible, custom main tab, custom action button, um, custom context menu item. They can be, uh, the new menu item can be in both in here and in here, or only in the panel, or only in the context menu, and the custom sub tab. So basically, you, you can change the way, you can add uh, things into the UI that you have. Give you a set of tools in order to do that. I'll go over these tools. Basically, looking at, at the, the most basic plugin you, you could use, it's just an, an HTML file with a JavaScript section. Uh, the first part will contain access to the API, saying I'm plug I would like the plugin API. My name is my plugin, and then I'm registering event handler function. In this case, I registered the UI init event. UI init event is event that's triggered when the admin portal is initialized. And every s the only thing I did here is adding a new main tab. That's the label. That's the, the init identifier. And that's the URL that I have. That's it. So basically, that would create me a new main tab. That will be the label, and when I will go to this main tab, it will access the URL HTTP to the host. At the end, I'm telling the API infrastructure, the plugin infrastructure, I'm ready to, to use, so that triggers basically uh, all the different things. So that's very basic plugin, just add a new main tab to the system. So we have the basic is a UI plugin. It contains the HTML file of the plugin. That's the one we, we saw a second ago. And we have a plugin descriptor, which is a JSON file containing different configuration items we, we need the plugin to have. And we can override it uh, if, if, if we need, if we come, if we install the plugin with a specific configuration and we would like to override it, then we can create a new file of, of the original one. So the locations of the plugins are usually stored over this engine UI plugin. 
the configuration file is also in that directory within the JSON file. And if we want to override the configuration, we should use the CLI. I'll show examples in a second. Let's do this. Uh, I'll show you uh, I'll go over the API in a second. So basically what we allow you to do is to add a new main tab, to add a new sub tab. Again, sub tabs are these ones. Uh, the tabs that are available when you uh, when you select specific entities in the main tab. You can change the URL of the sub tab. Again, assuming that you 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 have a host main tab and you go between the hosts, but this time you select another host, you want the URL of the sub tab to point to another URL. For example, let's take uh, 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 for example uh, uh, an external application we integrate to that that is aware of this host. So when you search on a host, you're going to access the URL that this uh, application has for this host. I'll show an example of a form and plug in that we created. The form in, for example, uh, uh, is aware of, of both the host and the VM. So if you send on a VM then and you want to see details that aren't available in the Azure Kongen and they are available in form and or in another uh, application we use, then you can search the URL of the sub tab to point to that specific URL in the application we use. Let's say you can extend the view of the view the administrator sees when he logs in uh, to the admin portal. You can also set whether the tab is accessible or not. For example, there may be entities that this tab should be accessible and for example, uh, uh, others that don't according to specific preferences. So you, can, you have control on that as well. You can add new action buttons. These are the buttons that I showed you. These are these ones. So when you add a new action button, you say uh, uh, what is the entity, what is the main entity that the action button should be uh, in. Uh, and you have a label. What's going to happen when you press the button? Uh, and that would basically give you this function right here. We also have a, a show dialog option. For example, you can have an action button that you press on it and it happens to, and it opens a new, uh, uh, a new dialog uh, pointing to some URL. And th these are the main, uh, the, the main functions that the, the Azure Plugin API gives you. Uh, some other useful ones are, are, are ones to, that show you the, what's the logged in username and what's the user ID. If you want to do some single sign-on uh, uh, solution between the web admin, uh, the, the admin portal of Azure, and the the other application, and you need the username for that, so you 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 have access to this to this information. We have different events that the UI plugin infrastructure supports. Uh, the UI init event is the one I showed you earlier that is triggered when the admin portal. Is, is generated, is, is initialized. For each entity, I have a select and change event. For example, if we are in the da data center main tab and you selected a different data center, to change the selection, the, the data center select and change event will be triggered. If we were in the VM uh, main tab and you selected a new VM, then the VM select and change will be triggered. So basically for each main tab, we have uh, an event for each Select and change. And we show examples on that as well. We have a user login or logout event. If you're doing some single sign on, uh, um, single sign on between uh, the admin portal and a different um, application, then you would probably want to log in. When you log into the admin portal, you would like to log into the external application. And when you log out, you would want to log out from this. other events that are useful in, in this talk are the REST API session required. That's basically uh, the way the API, the, the way the UI plugin API gives you to modify, uh, to do operations on the engine, okay? The UI, in the UI plugin, you can have, uh, uh, you, 
you can point to a specific URL, uh, but the fact that you're doing the UI PID with the engine leads to you want to affect the engine functionality. So you would you get here uh, uh, to the UI PID and infrastructure creator REST API template for you, and it gives it to you. And then you can use it in order to manipulate uh, specific operations or to manipulate specific things in the engine. For example, uh, um, a nice plugin is MetaFlow um, that allows you to create a new uh, uh, a volume in one of their filers and, and it stores the name in there. So you would have a main tab for, uh, uh, um, I don't remember if it's a main tab or an action button, but anyway, you, you say I would like to create a new, uh, a new volume and a new net of volume and then it will open you uh, the URL of the, the meta uh, application and you select the different meta properties. Again, it can explain all of these engines. And then at the end, it creates the volume and it wants to push it into Ovid as an inferred demand that you can remove. So, uh, um, so what we did here is, is we gave them the opportunity, we gave them the REST API setting and they, uh, and they can use it in order to, do, to add a storage domain to the system. Am I clear? Is the flow clear or? Am I? No? <laughs> is it clear or? So it uh, just gi gives the, pl the plugin the, the, the strength to do a system deploy. The, the other approach we could have taken is, is to give a specific operation for everything. So we decided to give the access to the API, which is more powerful. an example and then I, I'll move around. Um, the example I'm going to show you here is, is uh, less useful, I'd say, but, but more funny. Um, and then I'll show other examples as well. So, so here I was doing an API request on the Ovid engine. I hope it will work. Uh, when I stood here before the session, it worked one time and it didn't it didn't work one time and it worked two times. I, I'm not sure why it happened. Um, you see here, I select, uh, I, I go to the data center main tab, I select the data center and I do right click. And here you see, I have a new button called protect my data center from alien invasion. Okay, and now I have a game. Uh, I should have seen. I have an alien invasion game. Oops, I play and protect my data center. Now I would like to get out of here. And then it tells you, nope, you need to destroy the area that leads there. And I can tell you it's a very hard game. I tried to destroy data store a few times and then uh, uh, eventually I, I just uh, decided to cheat. Okay, I win, let's uh, get cheat in here and then I can close this dialogue. So it's a very stupid dialogue if you ask me, but it, it, it shows you, you, you it's in this example you basically created a new action button, you showed a new dialogue, um, over there there was a game, and and uh, when I cheated, it created some events there, so that, that was my bad. So that's, that's basically it. Um, very easy, I'll show you the code for that, it's, it's, not, uh, not, it's, not, it's not complicated at all. What? Ah, no, I, I meant uh, 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 a, t a method. I'll tell you what I meant. I think I'm in another slide, maybe? Yes, this one, there we go, okay. Um, no, what I, what I meant is it, it one of the events is message retrieved. It's a way for a, a new dialogue to switch messages between the dialogue and the uh, engine uh, infrastructure. So, so uh, uh, basically, uh, what we did here is that the dialogue uh, sent a, a message to the UI plugin telling him that I won. And um, uh, that, that's what happened in here. Um, if I show you the code for that, again, very simple. I created an init function that adds a new main tab action button. You see, 
for all of these investments. Uh, the scope was a laser printer, as was also the laser printer from Alien Invasion, which enables only one data center with your lecture. And when I click on that, it opens the Cosby Open Dialog Center. Now, the location I wanted for my uh, for my action button was only in the context menu because I don't want my bot to see that I can play Alien Invasion during my work hours instead I'm using the data center. So I don't want it to see it up there, so it's just in the context menu when you right click. Uh, there is also, I'll show it in a second, there is in a second there was also a new subtab that was created. Uh, again, in the data center scope, to have to show the score I have in protecting this data, data center from alien invasion. And I also asked um, to align it with the right one. If you see in here, you see the space feeder is still there. So the smart score is fine. So the open dialogue function called the API show dialog function. There's a label of data center with square clearing on the front because I can give uh, the React login infrastructure the, the, the details about the, the selected object. And we have some two buttons that we created in the dialog, skip and you get me out of here. That also gives you a way to open a new dialog but also get uh, buttons that can get you back to the index, to the DC level. And everything is an event in here, so I have uh, event registration. One of them is the UI init in order to use the right mode login. And the other one is the select and change of the data center. So again, if I have one, uh, uh, one data center that is selected, then I have a subtab for it with the score and the search. Uh, if I have more than one, then the subtab is not accessible because because when you select more than one uh, data center, no subtab is, is used. Uh, we talked about the message received, um, the message receive uh, event. That's the event that is used in order to exchange messages between uh, the, 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 the plugin itself and the infrastructure. So I have here several events, again, init, your name, and uh, you get scores. And then when I, when I cheated, I just uh, uh, posted the game win message to the parent. The parent is the uh, is, is the UI plugin. And I called API.ready at the end to tell the object engine that it can start initializing the game. Very simple plugin, very simple API, allows you to, to, to add uh, basically buttons and, and tabs, main tabs and sub tabs in every part of the engine. Um, again, I, I told you about the NetApp example. I show here another example of a, a plugin I wrote for Foreman. Basically, uh, uh, what we did there is um, we allowed, we added a Foreman dashboard tab. My environment was pretty dead, so I don't see a lot of events here, but if you know Foreman, it has a dashboard and you can just access the URL of the dashboard to see details. So. In here, I created a main tab that just directs you to a URL. Uh, uh, in this plugin, I also had uh, to write something on the Foreman side to do a more embeddable view of the dashboard, but I won't get into that. Now, when I'm in the virtual machine main tab and I select a virtual machine that, uh, uh, that Foreman is aware of, I can see here details taken from Foreman, different details on the VM, different uh, activity graphs, and stuff like that. Again, so I'll show the code for that later on, but to understand here that I have a new main tab, so I, add, so I use the add main tab action. Um, I have a new uh, sub tab in here for foreman details, and I have a, a VM select and change event in order to change the URL that, I, that I'm showing in the sub tab according to the VM that I selected. And if I select more than one VM, then the sub tab is irrelevant. So is the flow clear? So that's another use case. Uh, so again, the, uh, as I said, add the sub tab. I added two sub tabs here, one for details and one for graphs. Um, I created a 
healthy functioning from your power to your shoulder. So back pedal. And then slowly lift both those things over and over. And you have elbows in your main thrust to amp up the deck. Now in order to uh, uh, and it's also a configuration of the plugin in order to to contain the URL of the form and so forth so this is this is the the good use of the configuration what we wanted to do here is to create some sort of the REST API session in order to do that. So when the, uh, the session acquired event was triggered, I knew the plugin said knew that there is a new session and then we <laughs> it, 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 it issued a login to form. Uh, I, I also needed to add some code in the formant side in order to support the single sign-on operation. Basically, it took the session ID and verified it with the API. That took care of that. I won't get into the form inside, but just to show you a use case, another use case that you can use the REST API session for. Uh, the other use case is to, to use it in order to do things. Uh, in here, uh, I only used it in order to do, uh, to verify that the user is indeed logged in and that the session is, is indeed valid. virtual machine select exchange event. Uh, what I did here is I checked whether one VM is selected or more. And if one VM is selected, I, I uh, contacted, uh, I reached Foreman to check whether he is aware of this VM or not. Because the VM can be, perhaps it was created not through Foreman. If it's created through Foreman and Foreman is aware of that, then I will show the subtext. If it's not created through Foreman, then the subtext won't be visible. out, the user logged out event, I also logged out from Foreman. So this is the function that ties and shows the, the subtext, not really important. Uh, the only important thing here is that we, uh, I changed the subtext content URL according to the name of the, of the selected VM. set sub content URL. So uh, th this function is called in case that the VM was, was found as a host in Foreman. So I construct the URL and I set the sub tab URL. So when we set the sub tab, we will get to the proper URL in Foreman. So that's the main thing. Another thing I wanted to mention is that we added a new feature to allow you to uh, In our UI, we have an event sub tab in order to show different events that happened in the system that, that, that relate to specific entities. We added the ability to, to inject external events into the entity. So what you would do as a plugin that, that, that creates, for example, uh, let's take again the method example because I think it's a good one. Uh, uh, you created a new value. So, so when you tap the button, Metax can say, okay, I tell you to create a new value in, in my firebase, which would be exactly this one. So let me be added as an event to the object in there. Then it can create it. Then when it finished creating, it can send an event. It can add an external event saying the value was created from Foreman. Now I'm going to start creating the same and, and the next one and so on. So it, 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 gave, it, it gives you a way to, to do even more deeply deep integration. So the administrator knows what's happening in our VM. It's not, it, it didn't just press a button. He knows that the, v the value uh, uh, is, is now, uh, is now uh, um, uh, the creation of the volume is now in progress. He knows that the creation failed or succeeded. Uh, um, so it's not just a, you know, a black box that he doesn't uh, know what's the state of the things that are happening in there. So it's also powerful because you can, uh, as an administrator using this, the system, you can you can be aware of what's happening in real time. That's a new addition in 3.3, I think, right? Can I ask you? Any 
and parameters. Uh, existing logics that we have in the system, when we create a new uh, VM, we can kill it with host. For example, we added a new, uh, uh, once we added this infrastructure, we added a new filter to the VM uh, internally in the system. Um, and we also added the ability to write new uh, external filters in Python um, um, that can be loaded into the engine. So if I'm going back to the example, I would like to, to, to uh, define the maximum number of random VMs on a host. Then I want my filter to filter out hosts that run on more than three VMs. So I create a, a Python class called maxVM. I have a gfilter function over here uh, 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 that gets the, the host ID. These are the IDs of the hosts that are available for now for me to run the VM on and the VM ID. And I have here some ID numbers as well. For example, the maximum number of VMs uh, uh, is, an, is, is an argument that I get as an input value. So what I need to do, basically, if, if I don't look at the code for a second, what I need to do is to, is to go over all the hosts, uh, um, identify the ones running more than the maximum uh, number of VMs, Request and filter them out. That's the only thing I need to do. So I use the API in order to do that. I construct, uh, 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 like we saw earlier in the SDK section, uh, I construct a connection to the API giving the username, the password, and the URL, um, and we query for the host. Again, we, do, we go to the host collection of the produced host, and choose only, ho only hosts that are in the list of host IDs with, a, with an ID that is uh, from the host IDs I got as an input value. And then I'm going on the, then I'm going over the hosts one by one and I'm checking whether the number of active VMs on the host is smaller than the maximum. If it is, then I can use this host in order to run the filter. If it's not, then I can't. So this function basically filters out uh, VMs, uh, a host that can th that has more than 100 VMs uh, uh, in this in, in this in this case. Am I clear? The, the Python example, the, this Python example. Correct. Yeah. Just using the Python SDK to do that. The only thing uh, I found a bit. Uh, the thing honestly to be the when I prepared that slide here I, I saw that something um, I didn't write the script that's totally OCR and what bothered me here most is that you need to pass a username and a password etc uh, in order to to do that um, and we saw a second ago a solution we had for UI plugins that we gave you some recipe for so perhaps we will do that uh, in here as well to give you some recipe and the only difference is that for the UI plugins you really log you into the system this one is a periodic, both periodic or uh, um, a user-generated event, depending on, on whether you're load balancing or running a new VM. But perhaps we would, it would be nice to give a, a session ID in here. Is that it? Is there any extra things that I should add? Okay. I think that's the case, but perhaps it would be nice to add it. Thing it would do is, is, is to, 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 to check 
not available in this case and what is the situation with the case? Is it available based on both Chinese and not Chinese people? What is the situation for business in this case? So not only are the citizens of China Chinese citizens of Zhejiang are opposed to the election of Mr. Chen but they want to vote for him. Yes. That's the field goal. Now, assuming I'm not in, in such a hole, I have the way to do it. Uh, again, the lower the better. We, we use the current uh, policies we have for evenly distributed apply phases, and we created uh, a rate module for them. I won't get into that, but we can create external rate modules in Python again. So, uh, so in this example, I sort of Event uh, the evenly uh, distribution. So what we do here again is we have a class with the do score function, getting the host IDs and the VM IDs. These are the hosts that will let us run the case with them. Okay, these are host host two and host four in case of Chen. And I get the VM ID. It's just the VM that I want to uh, uh, to run right now. That you can use in this case. What I uh, what we're gonna do here is uh, uh, add is is getting the number of active VM VMs and 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 in post and added that to the score uh, to the score co set we are returning back. So I would add the host ID and the uh, and the weight will be the number of active VMs. So in that case, the 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 host with the best scores will be the host running. The lowest number of VMs, and if I want to be evenly distributed, I should run a VM in that case. So that's what that's what this weight function does here. Again, we need to access the uh, the API in here in order to get the details. Now, the reason we don't expose everything here, only the host ID and not the other way around, is because you can have a lot of a lot of hosts that you can run that that, that are in interested here, but maybe. You don't want to get the details in all of them. It, it depends on what you already know. So, uh, so that's that's an optimization in here that gives you the idea. Uh, it also keeps the API in here a bit cleaner, even in, in the if in the future you will have will have uh, other properties, and etc. You have you get the degree. And the third uh, the third part in here is is uh, a load balancing that periodically runs um, uh, and determines whether a VM should be migrated now in my environment. Uh, again, we had uh, we had two uh, uh, load balancing algorithms evenly distributed apply phasing and we created uh, uh, two predefined uh, load balancing policies for that. Uh, and in here what we what we basically do in the load balancer is we check what if we have in here to run on all the hosts and we check uh, um, if the number of active VMs on the host is smaller than the maximum. If that's the case, then we th then the host is, is, is in the right loop. that's not the case, then perhaps we have here an overloaded host. So we save that for, uh, for later in this case. Um, what, happened what happens eventually 
is that if we didn't find an overloaded host, then we don't need to do any migration at all because um, because no host is overloaded, all all the uh, everything is okay. We don't need to to do anything. But if we found uh, a specific host that that is overloaded, which means it has more than the maximum number of VMs, then we pick a VM and we say, please migrate this VM to one of these whitelist hosts. The whitelist host is the, the hosts that have uh, less than uh, the maximum number of VMs. So if I have, for example, one host that's running 102 VMs and three hosts that are running uh, 90 VMs, then I will choose, uh, uh, then I will put the host running 90 VMs in my whitelist and I will choose one VM running on the overloaded host and say, please migrate this, ho this VM to one of these hosts. So, so later on, it will choose one of the hosts. I mean, it, it, this code runs after, uh, um, basically, after that, it will run filters and it will run weights. So it's just, it, it's just uh, to reinitiate, so it's, it's just to say, just to choose, uh, this the input here will be passed through the filters and that's the weight, and then we have everything in place. I said we can write external policy units um, which we place them in user share or group schedule reports we plug in um, we analyze for a filter weight or bounds function to test the results and we export that um, in the UI so here is here is the uh, the UI for that um, we, we, we can add or edit a cluster policy and in that we can enable different filters. So now some of the filters that we see here like CPU and network are predefined filters and the regime uh, max VMs, the max VMs filter I showed you earlier, that was enabled. It's just to pick drag and drop filters into this policy. Then on the second section, we have weight measures and we drag and drop different uh, weights into that. Again, you can, you see here, txt is stands for external function and you see the predefined weights in here as well and we select one load balancer uh, for each policy in here because we use the the max uh, VMs uh, filter we have here uh, a property called maximum VM count that needs to be configured for this cluster policy so that's the first step the first part creating a new cluster policy and then if you go to the cluster, I try to show here, the cluster main tab and you select the cluster, you can edit the cluster policy, selecting the policy that we created a second ago, and you can uh, you can uh, override the default property from the default that was created earlier. So that's the way for you to apply uh, the cluster policy in, uh, in, in your specific policy. So that will eventually tell what filter will run, what weight factors will run, and what load balancer uh, will be run. It's a very powerful feature, depends if you need that. Any questions so far? We've already been a few more minutes and I'll be over. I know it's a long session, so. Uh, um, so uh, the, the next part will talk about video from hoops. The video from Hoops is, is a pretty uh, uh, old application. It's, 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 it's a feature that's been there for from the, the beginning. So uh, UI plugins appeared a year and a half ago and the scheduling API is just lately global. Um, we have a link to explanation on the video from Hoops and also a catalog of Hoops. Basically, a Hoops is a, a mechanism to, to customize different customizations. Um, it allows you as an administrator to define scripts that modify um, uh, VM operations, 
modify things on the host one in the VM, um, like every time that the engine is in a working run in system script, um, we, we create a host. We have VDSM, and when we create a new VM, when we would like to run a new VM and we select the host, we eventually get to VDSM from the VM team, create the VM on the host. Um, VDSM uh, um, calls libgroup in order to do that. But in between the call to libgroup, you can write a hook to modify the VM just before it gets to, to libgroup. can do all sorts of op operations in the hook that don't change the VM. If you want to write something to a log or if you would like to, to add some entry in the IP table for that specific VM, you can do that. So hook scripts are called a specific VM lifecycle event. Uh, as I said, they can modify the VM or apply a specific rule or run anything on the VM. So the different lifecycle events we can use is the VM, is there an idle on the VM continue? Uh, when you stop the VM, for example, if you created a new IP table entry in the VM, uh, when you ran the VM, maybe when you stop it, you want to delete it. You would use both the before VM starts and when VM starts. You can also hook to uh, host plugins before you host plugin this and after you host plugin this. Stand on VM uh, on a specific VM. I see a lot of libgroup on my screen here. You want to add them to a specific virtual machine. You go to the custom properties uh, policy tab, and in here you see the different hooks that are available for this VM, and you can uh, pass different parameters to it. Like which uh, which lifecycle to use. This is an example of a hook. What this hook does is add a, a, a workstop device. So it's basically um, a device that identifies something wrong happened to the VM. And if, if the VM crashed, it, it can do a specific operation. And here we decided that we would do a reset on it. So I think that now we have the workstop support already inside the Ovid engine. But before we had this support, people, people said we want to use that. Why don't you allow us to use that? So an easy way to, to add this functionality is to tell them or to write a hook by ourselves. Just write a hook. What the hook does is it, 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 it takes the, uh, uh, the domain XML of the VM. That's the XML that VDSM created in order to test if the lib group ran the VM. We get the device instruction. And we create a new element in the device instruction to add the new workstop device. For example, we'd like to have the, uh, the reset option. And we add it to the device.xml, and we write the domain instruction. So basically what we did here is uh, uh, we took the XML, added the device, take the XML, and then that's the XML that we would have to look at. That's it. And we have support. No need to add a UI for that, no need to add the engine code for that, only, uh, only add the hook and configure that in the VM uh, XML. before after VM migration event. So if the event of migration, the domain XML is on the internet, I am not going to see it. Uh, if I go to domain XML, this place is not useful, by the way, because they change the domain XML. Yeah, but 
tinha canal no YouTube, eu comecei a fazer um vídeo, é, que era sobre arte nova, que era do Alane, e a gente se conheceu no mercado principalmente ali sobre publicidade de Facebook, aí tipo, aí tipo, eu comecei a ver ele como empresário, aí foi a hora que eu fiz uma pesquisa no Google Scholar, que é o Google Scholar, foi a hora de conhecer o Alexandre Mendonça, que é o pessoal que trabalha com marketing da Web Design, Já vem um tempinho que a gente não tá falando, mas ninguém é, é um pouco velho de responsabilidade, desde o início do Facebook, eu não sou o cara mais velho do mundo, eu sou o cara que tá no início do Facebook, e no YouTube de marketing, e um pouco de Google Ads. Uh, as I said earlier, Stuff from the past and I'm so excited to be here and I think the best thing that I can do for this video is thank you to let us know what you want to have in the future. Any questions? Okay, so thank you for your patience. Hope you learned something new.